Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, the part that I want to focus on is beginning, like I said earlier, in uh, actually beginning in verse number 14, the Bible reads, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now, turn if you would to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter number 10. And I want to preach to you tonight on this subject. Here, This is the title of the sermon. I'm going to get into other subjects tonight. And I'm going to go into some other details. But the title of the sermon and the thing that I want to start by talking about is how to win children to Christ. How to win children to Christ. Now, Timothy knew the scriptures from the time he was a child, the Bible says. And he knew the scriptures, did you notice? Which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. Only the scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word of God. There's a movement out there to try to take away God's word from being a prerequisite for salvation. And it's, it's straight out of hell, my friend. Right. Because the, and I'm going to get into that in one of my points, too, about, hey, when you preach the gospel to children, use the Bible. Amen. When you preach the gospel to anybody, use the verses. Use the Bible. And the reason is that God's word has the power to regenerate the soul. Right. The Bible says that uh, being born again... Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, Amen. which liveth and abideth forever. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. How about John 5, 24? Verily I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You see, we're faith by faith alone, we're saved by faith alone, but faith cometh by hearing. The sower soweth the word, the Bible says. And so salvation comes through hearing God's word and then believing God's word. That's what you have to believe to be saved, God's word. You don't have to believe in Jesus. You know, there's another Jesus out there being preached, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Believing in a person named Jesus does not save you. There are, there are Hispanic people all over Phoenix named Jesus. And not a one of them can save you. It's not just the name of Jesus. Yes, there's none other name given under heaven. But it's got to be the Jesus of the Bible. Amen. It's got to be the Jesus of this word. And so you preach the word to get people saved. Not just you explaining it in your own words, but preach the word. Now, look at Mark chapter 10, verse 13. The Bible says, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children. That means allow the little children. Suffer them. Put up with them. Allow it to come unto me and forbid them not. For of such is the kingdom of God. Now watch this next verse. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. You see, the Bible says that the children can be saved. Yeah. People think that kids are too young, they can't understand it, they're too, wait till they grow up, wait till they're a teen, wait till they're an adult. He said, if you're an adult, you're going to have to go back to the mentality of a child in order to be saved. He said, you have to receive the kingdom of God as a little child to be saved. And so, in order to be saved as an adult, you have to have the mentality of a child. It's even easier for a child to be saved than for an adult to be saved. You see, because the gospel is simple. When you're making the gospel complicated, you can see why they think only adults or teens can understand it. But when you keep it simple that it's faith in Christ, Jesus paid it all. 100% Jesus. 0% our works. 0% turn over a new leaf. 0% turn from sin. 0% join the church. 0% be baptized. And 100% blood of Jesus Christ on the cross that saves us. 100% faith in Christ. That's simple. Even a child can understand relying on Jesus Christ to save them and get them back. You know how old I was when I got saved? I was six years old when I got saved. And I'm, let me tell you something. I know I was saved when I was six. I knew it then and I know it now. That when I was six years old, I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I was on my way to heaven. And so children can be saved. They can understand the gospel. Now, many religions teach an age of accountability is what they call it. 
Now, there is no age of accountability given in the Bible. I'm talking about a specific age where you suddenly become accountable and when you can become saved or unsaved at that point. Now, the, the Mormons teach that that age is eight years old. I don't know where they came up with that. I don't know where they came up with all the other weird things that they preach. But uh, they say it's eight. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, teaches that the age of accountability is seven. Now, I'll, I'll say this right now. Uh, I do believe, of course, from the Bible, that you know babies and very young children who die go straight to heaven. You know, and you say, well, how do you teach that? Well, there's three different scriptures in the Bible that teach that. It's not really within the scope of the sermon, but I'll allude to them. Second Samuel, where David's young child, seven days old, dies, and he says, he says, I will go to be with the child. He's referring to the fact that when he goes to heaven, he'll see the child. In the book of Job, uh, in chapter 3, he talks about an untimely birth. Basically, a miscarried child. A child who dies while it's being delivered or in the womb and is delivered prematurely. This could go for an abortion. This could go for uh, a miscarriage. It says that they go to a place where there's freedom and where the servant is free from a master. talks about a perfect place where children go. Uh, in, in, in the book of Job, or I'm sorry, the, the one about the perfect place, I believe, is in Ecclesiastes about an untimely birth. So basically, in Ecclesiastes and Job, you have children in the womb going, and by the way, it's a child, not a blob of right. tissue, or else it wouldn't go to be in a perfect place in heaven if it, if it passes away in the womb. Job said, why died I not in the womb? And he talked about it going to heaven. Again, it's not in my sermon. I just brought it up because I thought of it. But there's no specific age of accountability. You know, I guess God, we don't know everything. We don't know all things. But God knows the heart. And he must know that a very young child who's unable to understand the English language and cannot even speak or understand words is obviously too young to make that choice. We know that God, you know, is a gracious, merciful, loving God and pitiful God. And that's why, and you say, well, how can they be saved? Because Jesus died on the cross for their sins. Like he died for all of our sins. Yes, a one-year-old can sin, but can a one-year-old understand and comprehend the gospel? Okay, no. And so that the, the, the question is, how are their sins paid for by the blood of Jesus? Because right. Jesus died for every single person in this world. And he can, he can show mercy on whom he will show mercy. He can have compassion on whom he will have compassion. And he's chosen to save all that believe on him. But apparently he's also chosen to save those who are so young that they can neither believe nor disbelieve. And so they are uh, given a free pass into heaven through the blood of Christ. Okay. That's what we believe. It's taught in the Bible. Three different scriptures you can look up later. You can do it in the concordance. Just look up the word untimely and you'll see those, those verses. As well as the one in 2 Samuel, you can uh, look up that story. Now, uh, number one, I'm going to give you some points now on how to win children to Christ. How to win a child to Christ. We know that they can be saved. We know that a young child can comprehend the gospel. What's the exact age? I'm not going to say an exact age because it could vary from child to child. I got saved when I was six. I've seen kids get saved that were four, five, six years old, seven, eight, whatever. Some kids, you know, grow up faster than others. Some kids are smarter than others. Who knows? But that's not the point. The point is that we should take every opportunity we have to win a child to Christ. In fact, it's going to be easier and you're going to get more saved even than adults because they haven't been so corrupted and clouded by false religion by the time they become an adult. Number one, win children to the Lord door to door. Now, let me explain this. First of all, personally, if I go to a house and a little kid answers the door, the first thing I say is, are mom and dad home? That's the first thing I say, okay? And if mom and dad are not home, I, I walk away, okay? Because I'm not going to, and you know, you may disagree with me on that. That's fine. You can tell me your opinion. I'm just saying this is what I do, okay? If I'm not at the door, I say, are mom and dad home? If mom and dad are not home, I don't want to be put in a position, especially in today's world, where it seems like I'm talking to some little kid at the door, okay? In today's world of, of, of perverts and weirdos, you know, I, I don't want to come home and catch somebody talking to my kid when I'm not around and so forth. Now, if it's a teenager that's 14, 15, 16 years old, I'll talk to them. But I'm talking about a child answering the door. I don't know why these people are letting their kids answer the door at some ages. You know, sometimes I'll knock on the door. A four or five-year-old kid comes to the door. Yes? Hello? Now, I wouldn't even let my kids do that. And I don't talk to kids like that when their parents are home. I usually just hand them an invitation and say, give this to mom and dad when they get home. You know, and plus I don't want to ruin that opportunity to get the parents saved by abusing the fact that they're not home. Plus, 
sometimes you'll be giving the gospel to that child. I've seen people give the gospel to that child. And then the parents pull up and, and, and blow up and they're mad and everything. And then you're, you lost your opportunity to, to win them to Christ. Okay, That's my personal method. Okay, But you say, well, then how am I going to win children to the Lord door, door, door? Well, number one, as soon as you're through winning the parent to the Lord, if a child's there that's old enough to understand, you could, you could explain it to them. Usually a child is listening in. And as soon as you're done praying with the, the person that you just want to cry, you know, once they believe it and understand it, you can ask the child then. You can turn to the child and say, did you understand what I was saying? And then you can maybe go into a little more detail and depth to try to get them. But let me give you a new way that you might not have thought of to win children of the Lord at the door. I did this today and I've done this many other. Were you with me, Brother Dave, when I was at Lachey's house over here? Yeah. Okay, let me, Brother Dave has seen me do this. This is a method that I use. Sometimes, whether, whether the parents got saved, or whether the parents don't even want to listen to the gospel, or whether the parents are already saved, here's a method that I use, and, and he's seen it in action, where I say to the, to the parents, may I tell your children a Bible story? Now, I've done this before, and today, when I was out soul winning, I had a crowd of kids in this trailer park. Because I said to the kids, I said, go ask your parents, because their parents did not speak English. So I could, you know, so I said to the, I said to the children, I said, go talk to uh, your parents. You know, I try, you know, they weren't interested. I, I got in the door, and it was, I speak Spanish, and I, I gave the gospel to somebody else saying Spanish, but they weren't interested or whatever. But I said, can you ask your mom if I can tell you a Bible story? So they all ran and asked, and they were all excited, and they got permission from their parents. And the parents were watching as I gave the, as I gave this, this Bible story. You know, of course, what do you think the story was? It's all about Jesus, you know, being born and dying on the cross. And that's a method where people, will, a lot of times, will say, sure, absolutely. When we were at Lachey's house, that's what I did. I said, may I tell the children a Bible story? Sure. They all gathered around. There were, what, eight or nine kids? Eight or nine kids gathered around, and I sat there and went through with them and made it exciting. And, and guess what? I used the Bible verses when I did it. I didn't just, I didn't dumb it down. I used the Bible verses. So, number one, remember that point. When you're out at the door, may I tell your children a Bible story? Can I tell the kids a Bible story? And many times people will let you talk to the kids. And sometimes they'll even gather other kids and set them down for you. And you can preach them the gospel and talk to them one-on-one -on -one and get them saved. So that's number one. But number two, you must be extremely thorough when you're giving the gospel to children. You may assume that kids understand certain terms because you understand them, but many children in today's world know nothing about the Bible or spiritual things. Even children who go to church every week are completely ignorant of simple Bible terms. Many times, I'll be giving the gospel to a child. Today, in fact, today it was a similar thing. I asked that question, had a group of, you know, seven, eight kids crowd around me to, to hear the story in that trailer park we Okay? Uh, let me give you an example. Do you know what sin is? No, none of them knew what the word sin is. But we might just blow through that. Oh, for all of sin, have you sinned before? For all of sin, to come short of the glory of God. Take the time and, and explain to them, sin is when you break God's commandments. Sin is when you disobey God. And then, you know, I give them some examples of sins. What they are. Because you don't want to just assume that they know what sin is. Hell. Many children are unaware of the existence of hell. We take these things for granted. But many children today don't even know that Adam and Eve were the first people on this world. Yeah. They've never heard of Noah's Ark. It's not being taught in school. It's not being promoted on television. And so many children are oblivious to these basic Bible principles of what the word sin means. Even children who grew up in church. I talked to a girl who went to uh, Pilgrim Rex. You know, this holy roller, rolling in the aisle, Baptist church. <laughs> In, uh, in Phoenix, you know, this great big Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church. How many people in this church have been out soul winning and somebody said, I go to Pilgrim Rest? Okay, and it's, a, it's one of these ones where they believe in speaking in tongues, they roll down the aisles or whatever, you know, you know metaphorically speaking. They're, they're charismatics, but they call themselves Baptist. It's just a bunch of rah-rah. I've, I've talked to so many people. Don't try to defend that church to me, because guess what? I've knocked these doors. I've talked to hundreds of people from that church, and by and large, usually I ask them, do you know for sure if you die today, you're going to heaven? And they said no. I hope so. I'm trying, whatever. Some, I've met some people from there that gave a clear testimony of being saved, but the vast majority could not tell me. Is that been your experience? Same? Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, basically, 
She went to kill the rest. She was 14. She'd been going there since she was a little kid. She had never heard of the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. She was shocked. She couldn't believe it. She said, did that really happen? Are you serious? I said, yes, of course not. You know, I, I show, I, and I showed her a bunch of verses on the resurrection. So do you see what I'm saying? You can't assume that they've been in church, that they know the Bible, because many churches are nothing more than a social club and a rock concert and a big feel-good emotional thing. So number two, you've got to be extremely thorough. Even simple words that we take for granted, like eternal, everlasting, you must explain the definition of these words as you go. And by the way, everlasting is a good word to use with children because it's so easy to understand. Everlasting lasts forever. Whereas eternal is maybe a little bit tougher of a word. Still not that hard of a word, but it's tougher than everlasting. That's why I love the fact that the King James Bible is the only modern translation that I know of that even has the word everlasting in it. Did you know that the NIV removes the word everlasting completely? Because the NIV is trying to be so easy to understand. They took out the hard word everlasting and they replaced it with the word eternal every time. Everlasting and eternal are two different words. You say, well, they mean the same thing. Well, they do mean the same thing except from two different angles. The word everlasting means it lasts forever. The word eternal means it never ends because E means not and, you know, if you break down the, the, uh, the root words, eternal is like terminate, and it means not ending. That's two different concepts. Here. Because one of them means it goes on forever, the other one means it never ends. Yes, that is the same thing, but boy, do I really understand how my salvation is with both of those words telling me it's going to go on forever, it's never going to end. God used both for a reason. And so it's two different words. And everlasting is a great word to use with children because they understand what it means. And so, uh, but, but you must explain to them the definition of these words. Point number three, use the verses. Say, oh, the verses have big words that the kids can't understand. Then explain them the words. Expound to them what those words mean. But don't do away with the verses. Many people, they think when they're winning children the Lord, they'll use a wordless book. Who's ever heard of the wordless books? It's a little book with colors on the pages. And they just talk about, oh, you know, red stands for the blood of Jesus. Brown is for, you know, the cross. And then they explain the cross. And they go through this. That is not the gospel unless, you're, unless you've memorized the verses and you're quoting the verses word for word. Open, don't open a wordless book. Open the word of God. Amen. What kind of a, a wordless book? Who comes up with this stuff? But they dumb it down. Kids don't need a picture. Show them a picture of Jesus. You don't know what Jesus looked like. Show them the Word of God. Read the verses to them and use God's Word no matter what the age. They can understand it if you explain it to them and help them understand it. Don't change the words either. Read it the way it says it in the King James and tell them what the words mean. And then read it the way it says it in the King James. Number four. And by the way, Timothy knew the Word of God from a child. The Holy Scriptures. Number four. Use illustrations to help the child understand profound, deep concepts. Now, Jesus used illustrations throughout the Bible to help people understand things. He used illustrations about things they understood. Farming, fishing, uh, you know, uh, looking for treasure out in the ocean, looking for treasure in a field. He used illustrations that people could understand. Use illustrations because some of the concepts of salvation might be a little tough for a child to grasp. Here's some example illustrations you could use. Number one, I like to use an illustration about maybe being punished in place of a sibling. Because, you know, you're trying to explain to them Jesus Christ's substitutionary death for us on the cross. So I usually show them that Jesus died for us in um, Romans 5, 8. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I explain to them, you know, what if you were to steal a cookie out of a cookie jar, for example? Mom is going to spank you and one of your other siblings took the spanking for you. You know, I just explain it to them in a concept they can understand. And I explain to them that, you know, hell is a lot worse than a spanking. Dying and going to hell, but Jesus paid that punishment for us. And by the way, when you give the gospel to children, explain to them about hell. I don't care if how, oh, I don't want to scare them. But you want them to go to hell, huh? But you don't want to scare them? Well, you can get people saved without telling them about hell. How are you going to get somebody saved without telling them about hell? Uh, it's going to, I mean, what are they being saved from? I mean, what does it even, how does the word saved really mean anything? 
if you don't know what you're being saved from. I mean, stop and think about that for a minute. Saved? It may be saved. Am I in danger? What's the danger? What is the danger of dying? And after death is the second death of going to hell. That's the danger here. The danger is dying and going to hell. And if you don't have a danger, if you don't have hell, then how do you have saved? And so I always, every time, I don't give the gospel to anybody without explaining to them the, God's punishment of hell. Explain them that they're a sinner and that they deserve good. And again, this sermon is not about how to win somebody to Christ. I've done sermons on how to win somebody to Christ. This is just how to win children to Christ. So, you ought, you, in order to understand the sermon, you have to know how to win somebody to Christ in the first place. I'm just adding to that. Okay, when you're talking to children, talk to them about hell. Talk to them about, you know, the punishment. Because that's how they're going to help them understand. And, and they're not, it's not going to scare them. Think about the stuff that they're watching on TV. It's a lot scarier than Anything you're telling them about hell. Good night. But let me read this for you. This is from the June 2006 issue of the North Valley Newsletter. This is North Valley Baptist Church in Santa Clara, California, which is a totally watered-down independent Baptist church. This is what they had in this section called How to Lead Children to Christ. You say, oh, why are you criticizing? Well, why don't you listen to it and you tell me if I'm wrong. How to Lead Children to Christ by Langford Oxendine. Point two reads as follows. Sin must be punished. For the wages of sin is death. Explain hell. Refrain from using frightening, offensive descriptions of punishment in hell. Did you hear that? Refrain from using frightening and offensive descriptions of punishment in hell. These are children, after all. Instead, focus on the worst part about hell. Now, right away, that, that's a little weird. So, I should stay away from anything that's frightening or offensive... But now I'm supposed to focus on the worst part? That sounds scary. But no, see, they're lying about what the worst part is. Because listen to this. Instead, focus on the worst part about hell. Being separated from God. And from everyone else who's been saved from that awful place. So apparently, when you're giving the gospel to children, don't use any of the descriptions of hell that Jesus used. Because that's offensive and frightening. So there's something offensive about the fact that hell burns with fire? There's something offensive about the fact... You know, I, I'm sorry, but if that's going to offend somebody, maybe they ought to get offended and then get saved. Sorry, man. Man. I mean, that's offensive to tell somebody that hell is a place of darkness and fire and torment and weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth and that it goes on forever? Look, that's what hell is. How else can you describe hell? It's, a, it's, it's kind of a warm place. It's a little bit warm. I'll give you that. Do you like, do you like cold weather? You won't like hell. It's heck, you know? If you die, you're going to go to heck. Okay? Okay, kid? Get saved. Um, he says, uh, you know, avoid frightening and defend, offend, or no, refrain from using frightening and offensive descriptions of punishment and hell. Because these aren't children, after all. Instead, focus on the worst part about hell, being separated from God. Now, first of all, number one, you're not separated from God in hell. Amen. Here's a newsflash for you. Maybe you should get a Bible and start reading it. Revelation 14.10, it says, They shall be punished. It says, They shall be punished with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Right. They shall be, oh, and by the way, the verse 4 is, they have, they're tormented day and night. They have no rest. Oh, no, sorry to offend you, sorry to scare you, but you're tortured day and night in hell, according to Revelation 14, 10, and 11. You're, you're, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. They're tormented day and night in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb. Don't tell me that hell is separation from God. You cannot be separated from God in this world but when God is, is omnipresent. Okay, think about it. You say, oh, well, the Bible says your sins have separated you from God. Yeah, there's a separation in the relationship. There's a separation in the fellowship. But I'm going to tell you something. God is everywhere. According to the book of Psalms, He said, if I ascend into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. So there you have it. And yet you can't show me a verse that says that you'll be separated from God in hell. It's a lie. 
And you know where it came from? The Jehovah's Witnesses. You know where else it came from? Pope John Paul II said that hell is separation from God. You know who else it came from? Billy Graham in the 1960s was going around teaching. He said, I'm not sure if there's really fire in hell. He said, I don't know if there's fire in hell. But he went around teaching that hell is separation from God. Billy Graham's a liar. Pope John Paul II is burning right. in hell right now. The Jehovah's Amen. Witnesses Amen. are false witnesses. That's right. Why are we borrowing their doctrine? I thought we were Bible-believing Baptists yeah. who believe Revelation 14, 10, 11, who believe David when he said that God is in hell and in heaven and on this earth, that believe Isaiah when he said that a stream of brimstone out of the Lord's mouth is what kindles hell. Hey, God created hell. God is the one who's tormenting people in hell. Who is it? The devil? The devil's not in hell. The devil walketh about this earth seeking whom he may devour. And God is everywhere. He is in all things. By him all things consist. Heaven, hell, earth, it's all the Lord's. Period. And so don't tell me that hell is separation from God. I'm not going to take some kid and not tell him that there's fire in hell. But I'm going to tell him that it's separation from God. Look. Unsaved people want to be separated from God. That's why they're not in church today. If they loved God so much, they'd be in church. They'd be reading the Bible. They'd sing the hymns. They want nothing to do with God. Oh, but don't you understand? If you don't get saved, you're going to be separated from God. Great. So what? Who cares? We don't like Him anyway. Think about it. And so, no, don't water down the gospel for children. Give it to them straight. Don't lie to them. Just tell them the truth. There's nothing offensive about the Bible. When the Bible talks about not offending people, not offending children, it's not talking about reading them the Bible. Okay, the Bible is not offensive. The Bible is life. The Bible is truth. The Bible is health. Okay, this is what they need to hear. And they need to hear the whole thing. Heaven and hell. And so uh, that's, that's another point right there. But you know, illustration about taking the punishment for a sibling is a good illustration. Illustration about a gift. That's something that children are very understanding of. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a good illustration to use about how Jesus paid for it. We just have to receive it by faith, believe in it. Oh, and, and by the way, explain the word believe. Many people don't know what the word believe means, and many people are twisting what the word believe means. Lately I've been out soul winning, and they say, Well, you know, but when you believe, that means that you're following Christ. You know, or when you believe, you're saying you're believing on the works that he did, and you're going to do the same thing. You know, they twist the word believe. Can I define for you the word believe using the Bible? Look at 1 John chapter 5, where the definition of the word believe is found. Very clearly, we'll see what believe is. 1 John chapter 5 defines the word believe by giving us its opposite. Look at 1 John chapter 5, verse number 10. And we will see the word believe defined by, not by a dictionary... Not by religion, but by the Bible itself. Look at 1 John 5, 10. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Now this is a verse that I show children when I'm winning them to Christ, when I want them to understand the word believe. And by the way, it takes me at least probably, it takes me about twice as long to win a child of the Lord as if they wouldn't go. Because I've got to explain things. I've got to be thorough. They don't understand things as quickly sometimes. But look, this is a verse I like to show children when I went into Christ to show them what the word believe means. And I say to them, I have a red car. Do you believe me? They say yes. I say, what if you didn't believe me? You'd be making me a liar. You'd be, you're basically saying I'm lying. If I tell you I have a red car and you say I don't believe you, you're saying that, you, that I'm lying. And that's all believe means, my friend. Right. Don't say, well, believe means you're going to follow in his footsteps. That is not what it means. Believe is the verb for the noun faith. And it's faith, not works. Right. Not faith plus works. Not faith automatically becomes works. No, it's faith without the deeds of the law. Without works. And so that's a great verse right there to just scripturally define the word believe. It's the opposite of making someone a liar. It's, it's basically affirming that what they're saying is true. And if you believe the record that God gave of His Son, if you believe this book, you're saved. If you believe Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world, that it's all through Him, that it's, 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 it's by grace through faith and His shed blood on the cross, if you believe this word, you're saved. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life. 
and we already went through that. So uh, that's another illustration. And a third illustration you could use about being a child of God. That's a great illustration to explain eternal security, eternal life. You're God's son. And I explain to them how my son will always be my son. I'm going to discipline him. I'm going to train him. I'm going to teach him. But nothing can separate that bond. And that's how eternal salvation is. I go into that with them. And then uh, that's, that, that's about it for my points on winning children of the Lord. I hope that will help you out. But uh, remember, what do you say at the door? You know, you're done with the parents or the parents don't want to listen. Maybe you don't speak the language. Maybe the parents speak Spanish, the kids speak English, and you don't speak Spanish. That's a pretty common situation. Instead of just walking away, you know, talk to the talk to the 10-year-old child or whatever age. Today, I had a crowd of kids around me, about eight kids, sit down and listen to the gospel. Now, one of them was older, and she understood it for sure and got it for sure. The, the rest of the ones that were crowded around me, I wasn't really sure whether they were understanding. I did the best I could to explain to them, go through with them. When I was done, all the children said that they believed it, and they prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save them and put their faith on them. You know, when we were counting up the numbers, I would count up how many people we had saved. I just counted the one that was a little older that seemed to just completely understand everything I said. The other children were joking around a little bit, and it was tough to tell. Who knows? You know, I don't know. But the point is, it's not about numbers. The point is, I gave the gospel to all these children. They all heard it clearly. And, and thank God for that. Amen. I'm glad I didn't just walk away. I mean, I could have just walked away, but I said, can I tell your children a Bible story? And you know, somebody taught me that, and I'm glad they did. Because I've used that to win a lot of children of the Lord. And so, remember that method. Uh, be thorough. Explain the meaning of words. Believe. Hell. Everlasting. Take your time. What's the hurry? What's the rush anyway? We're talking about a human being here. Amen. Take whatever time is necessary to do the job right. This isn't ever some kind of a, uh, a speed race. Amen. Stop and take the time to win somebody to the Lord. If, it take, if you're talking to a kid, if it takes an hour, then take an hour. Amen. Be in a hurry. What's the big hurry anyway? If it was your child, you wouldn't be in a hurry. And by the way, win your own child to the Lord. That's a great concept. What a concept, you know? <laughs> when you're child of the Lord. Many people don't take the time to give the gospel. You know how many times I've sat down and given the gospel to my kids? Hundreds. And not only that, but I take them out soul with me. And then they hear the gospel, hear the gospel. They can all quote to you all the verses, the whole thing. They've heard it, and they've heard it, and they've heard it. And, and, and let me tell you something. i prayed with them again and again. When they're young, I don't... You say, oh man, they're praying over and over again. They're confused. They're not confused. They know that they're going to heaven because of Jesus. And that means they're going to heaven. Because they're trusting Jesus alone for salvation. You see, we bought into this idea that salvation is some emotional experience. That's right. What was the exact day and hour and time? A day, date. Do you know that you have the date written in the back of your Bible? Then you're not saved. <laughs> you tell me what time of day it was, then you're not saved. You know, these, it's because these powerless false teaching evangelists and missionaries and pastors, they want to go around and have some big altar call. So they try to get everybody to doubt their salvation. You know what I mean? And try to get them to doubt it because they didn't tingle. And most of them are preaching, you know, repent of your sins. And look, nobody's totally repented. So if you get up and scream and yell and, and, and get all scary, if you got an unsaved person who... You know, is trusting, repent of your sins, you can probably get them to come down the aisle again and again just yeah. to make sure. And by the way, coming down an aisle doesn't save you. Right. Where does it say in the Bible, come down an aisle and thou shalt be saved? It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Right. It's not some emotional experience. It's not some feeling. I, I've heard people get up and say, well, it's really hard for kids who grow up in a Christian home because they doubt their salvation so much. They're constantly doubting it. Because they didn't have this dramatic, life-changing event where they were living a filthy life and now all of a sudden they're living for God. That's not salvation anyway. You know why they're doubting it? Because you're confusing them with your lies and heresy. And you know, you wouldn't be, they wouldn't be confused if they knew that if they're believing the Bible and believing Jesus Christ as their Savior and trusting Him alone to take them to heaven by faith, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Hey, they know what they believe and they'll know whether they're going to heaven based on what they believe in their heart. If you believe that in your heart, confess it with your mouth. Hey, thou shalt be saved. And if they believe it, they ought to know that they're saved. But not when somebody's telling them, well, you know, you've got to turn from a wicked life to be saved. 
It's a lie anyway. And that's what's confusing people. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. My kids aren't confused right now. They know they're safe. Because, oh, all yeah, right. How do you know they're really safe, huh? <laughs> you know what? They believe this book and they're on their way to heaven. Amen. And if you know what, let, let me just put it to you this way. Let me just break it down. <clears throat> if anybody who believes on Jesus Christ does not go to heaven, then God's a liar. Yeah. Did you hear me? If there's a person in this world who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, who doesn't go to heaven, then God lied. So, oh, but they didn't pray right, or they didn't come down an aisle, or they didn't repent. They are saved if they believe, or else that book's not true, because it says it a hundred times. Right. Whosoever believe it, everyone that believe it, that is that true or not? That's true, amen. And so these kids that are believing that are saved. Now you got to believe it. They got to know what they believe. If they're trusting works, they're not saved. If they're, if they're believing in another Jesus, they're not saved. But if they, if they believe this book and the Jesus of the Bible, relying on Him alone for salvation, they're saved. And by the way, if you believe that, you're saved. You don't need to come down the aisle. If you believe that, you're saved. If you don't believe it, you're going to go to hell. You need to believe it. Right. Period. And so, uh, I, don't, I don't know where this stuff came from, but it just keeps getting passed down from one person up, passed down, passed down. Tradition, and repeated, and repeated. Right? What kind of Right? Right? Gotta be changed. Gotta change your life. Right? Right? It's ridiculous. But let's move on to a different subject. Look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter number 18. So, I, want, I wanted to just explain to you how to win a child to Christ, Right? Get them saved. Suffer the little children. Come to Jesus Christ, right? They need to be saved. It's easy for them to be saved because it's their mentality to trust and believe in God. Well, kids have to be taught evolution. They grow up, to, they, they just believe it, that it's God if you don't tell them anything. They have to be taught all this other stuff. But look, look down at your Bible, Luke 18, 15. The Bible says, and they brought unto him also, what's the next word? Infants. Okay. Now, what is an infant, according to the Bible? An infant is a child. Let me just give you the definition of the word infant. Have you ever heard of the infantry? Right? Okay, what is, what is infantry? Foot soldiers. Because the word infant comes from a root word that has to do with walking. And an infant is a child who is unable to walk. Okay, so when a child starts walking, they're no longer an infant. Ladies, what are they? Starts with a T. A toddler. So you go from being an infant to being a toddler, okay? So an infant is a child that is unable to walk. Now, can an infant be saved? No. Because infants, now if it's an infant that's an adult who you know, can't walk, okay, then they can be saved. But I'm talking about a child who is so young that they cannot walk. I'm talking about a child who's 11 months old or 12 months old, 13 months old. Obviously, they're unable to communicate. They're unable to understand God's word, to comprehend God's word, to confess with their mouth. I mean, they're, they're young. Right? They don't understand the gospel. I can explain the gospel to my daughter Rebecca. She's not going to understand it. I can explain the, doc do the doctrine of salvation to Miriam, who's been walking for a very long time, and she would not understand it. I mean, she cannot comprehend it at this age of, of one, of almost two. Okay? But yet these children were brought to Jesus. Why? So that they, so that they could be baptized? No. you got to believe before you're baptized, Acts 8.37. But it just says they were brought to him also infants that he would touch them. Right? They just wanted him to touch them and bless them. Jesus Christ, right? I mean, good night. If you were living back then, wouldn't you want Jesus to touch your kids? <laughs> Absolutely. Because remember, everybody's touching, he's healed and all this stuff, right? So they just wanted to get a blessing, not from the Pope. And people want the Pope to touch their kid like he's Jesus or something. Yeah. Isn't it true? They want the Pope to touch them. And, oh, this man touched the Pope. I'm never going to wash my hand again. <laughs> No, this is Jesus. This is God in the place. I want to touch him too. I mean, people were trying to touch the hem of his garment, right? So they want to bring these in, but they had this idea, let's bring our child to him so that he can touch them. And what happened? But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. Look at Matthew 19. Flip back just a few books toward the left. Matthew 19, 13. Matthew 19. Now, he uses an illustration. You've got to receive the, the, the kingdom of God as a little child in order to be saved, which is true. What's, what's, what's the mentality of a little child? Humility. They rely on mom and dad. They rely on their mother and father 
for everything, for food, to clean them, to change their clothing. Okay, and that's what salvation, it's all Jesus. You've got to have that humble mentality. You have to humble yourself and be like a little child. Say, but here, we're not talking about these little kids being saved because they're infants. They're tiny little kids. And all he did, he didn't preach them the gospel. All he did was put his hands on them and bless them. And that's what it says where we're about to read, Matthew 19, 13. Then were there brought unto him little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them, but Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed them. So he didn't preach to them. I mean, they're obviously too young to be saved, these infants. But he did, you know, lay his hands on them. He did bless them. He did talk to them. He did speak with his mouth to them and bless, give them a blessing out of his mouth. And, you know, he went on his way. You say, what are you talking about? Turn to Matthew 18. Just one, one chapter back. What are you trying to say, Pastor? What is the point of this? What are you talking about? Let me tell you something. We ought to receive and not feel that it's a burden to have infants and little children in the house of God. That's right. Now let me tell you something. There's a tendency for people to reject infants. Don't tell me there's not because we just read it in the Bible three different places. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, where the disciples said, we don't want these little kids around. The disciples said, we don't want these babies around. We don't need infants around. And Jesus called them and said, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute, come back. I want you here. You need to be here. Hey, get that kid and let Jesus touch him. Let Jesus talk to that kid. Let Jesus speak to that child. You see, no, Miriam is not going to be saved today. She's too young to understand. But you know what? The seeds have already been planted in her mind. Of the word of God and salvation. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter whether she hears the word of God or not. Just because she's too young to be saved doesn't mean it doesn't matter that God blesses her. That Jesus blesses her. That Jesus touches her. Hey, it means something or else Jesus wouldn't have done it. And so don't tell me that, that infants and children are too young to profit from God's word and, and, and being in contact with Jesus. Think about this now. And look at Matthew 18, 1, while you do. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him, and said him in the midst. Now, how did he call a little child unto them? Because there was a little child there listening to him preach. Are you listening? Did he get on the phone and call a little child unto him? No, he said, Come here, kid. And he set them in the midst. Now, what was a young child, what was a little child in the next chapter of Matthew 19? An infant, according to the Bible. Just to compare spiritual with spiritual here. In the same breath, he's talking about an infant and a, and a young child, a little child. Suffer a little children to come unto me. He's referring to infants. And here, he takes a little child. You say, well, how do you know it was an infant? Because he said it in the midst. Now, I'm not going to pick up you know, Brett and set him somewhere. I'm not even going to pick up Solomon and set him somewhere. Because he can what? Walk. You pick up and carry little kids. Maybe they're toddlers or infants, right? It says, he took a little child. Jesus called a little child unto him. And set him in the midst of it. And he said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children... You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. He's pointing at this little infant that has to be picked up and carried. Spoon fed. Diapered. Changed. He said, that's what salvation is. I do all the work. That's what salvation is. Relying on me. That's what salvation is. Humbling yourself and relying on Jesus Christ to get you to heaven. He said, that's how you have to be. But how was that child there? Because the child was there to hear him preach. Because he said, some of the little children, forbid them not to come unto me. Now, let me ask you something. If Jesus was preaching to little children and infants and young children, why am I too good to preach to a baby or a little child or an infant? Am I above Jesus Christ? That, oh, oh no, not in my service. Oh, no, that might upset my concentration. Hey, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Amen. And children and infants of all ages will always be welcome in the services of Faithful Word Baptist Church. Amen. Amen. If Jesus could preach to them, I'll preach to them. If the disciples got rebuked for taking them out of the, the preaching service, then I'm not going to take them out of the preaching service. I'll just take their rebuke and apply it to myself and say, let's allow the children to get the blessing from God in this service. Said, uh, you know, except if you be converted, become as little children. You shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child. Remember, that's what I was saying. That's what the illustration meant. Humility. Relying on Jesus. The same is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But look at verse 5. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. Oh, uh, excuse me. Little children are not welcome in the service. All right, bye, Jesus. See you later, Jesus. You're not welcome. Isn't that what he just said? Mm -hmm. You receive the little child, you receive me. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, two-year-old. You're not welcome in this service. All right, bye, Jesus. Go to the nursery, Jesus. Go, they got a flannel graph for you there, buddy. <laughs> See you later. They'll put you in the swing and turn it on and strap you in and you'll uh, get your sea leg by the time you're, you know, three years old. You'll, be, you'll become a great sailor someday because you've swayed and swung in a swing all day instead of being held by somebody listening to the Bible being preached. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Look at verse number 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. And see, by the way, the little ones which believe in him was not the same as the infants. Okay, just to clarify for you. He said, of these little ones which believe in me, it's a different group. Uh, verse number 10. Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven their angels do always behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. Now what does that mean? He's saying, you want to be careful how you treat kids? You know, get away from me, you brat, you know. Get away, shiny bother me, you know. You're, you, you know you're, we're too busy for kids here, you know. We got a special little place for you guys. Just get out of here and, and we'll put somebody who joined the church last week, you know, in charge of watching you. So we can do the really important work right here. No, that's not right. I mean, he's saying here, look. Their angels do always behold the face of my Father, which is in heaven. God, what's that talking about? Angels, you know? You say, oh, you believe in guardian angels? It's what the Bible says. Because, I mean, the Bible teaches guardian angels in, uh, maybe it doesn't call them by those words, but in Hebrews chapter 1, are they not, he said, are they not spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? To minister, to, to, to help. Jesus was ministered to by angels when he was in the wilderness. Okay, there, you know what? I believe that angels are a real thing, and obviously that angels are sent to protect us for whatever reason. It's, you know, it's just a Bible fact. It's a Bible truth. And God's saying that, you know, their angels do always behold the face of my Father's in heaven. He's saying he's going to get the report, you know, about the way that you try. <coughs> and so you better be careful not to offend a little child, not to be a stumbling block. And by the way, when, when my children watch you commit sin, that's a stumbling block. You better, you better be careful how you act and the way you live around my kids or anybody else's kids. Because you're causing them to stumble. You're offending them. And when you throw them out of church, I'd say that's offending them. Many, many churches, you can't even be in the service until you're 12 or 13 years old. Because they have junior church. That's right. You say, well, what's the difference between junior church? Uh, because it's not church. Because it's not the assembly with all of God's people. Uh, what's wrong with junior church? Because it's dumbed down. Mm -hmm. It's taught by a woman half the time. And then you wonder why kids grow up and then they go to a church pastored by a woman. Well, you're the one who stuck them in some woman church till they were 13 years old. You're the one that put them in a class when they were 8 and 9 taught by a woman. They came and they didn't sing the solid rock. They didn't sing Blessed Assurance. They don't sing to God be the glory in these junior churches. They don't sing Jesus saves. There is a fountain. Jesus paid it all. Somewhere in outer space God has prepared a place. And then you wonder why they grow up. You wonder why they grow up and go to this wild holy roller church. Amen. That's good. Amen. You know, and I'm not saying that that's, I'm not saying that all those songs are bad, but many of them are. Somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for those who trust Him and obey. Is that true? God's preparing a place in heaven for those who obey, trust Him, and obey. Well, I thought it was just belief. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's, you know, that sounds that sounds like it's sending a pretty mixed message there. You say, you say, are the songs wrong? I mean, right up, right up, right down, right happy all the time. I mean, now, first of all, I'm not happy all the time. Jesus wasn't happy all the time. And not only that, but that song just doesn't sound like it's real deep. 
I just think, I think that, the, you say, what about deep and wide? I did not know what the song deep and wide meant until I was 24 years old. I sung that song my whole life. Deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flowing deep and wide. I did not know what that meant until I was 24. When I was 24, somebody said, it's about the blood of Jesus. Whoa. I'm not kidding. I mean, I was shocked. Really? I was like, I never know what that... Hey, let's sing it together. Wide and deep, wide and deep. You know, I'm sorry, but I'll take the hymns with the doctrine and, and the, the... Can you understand what I'm saying right now? You know, what... what? Oh, but it's got to be fun for the kids. Life isn't always fun. Church is not supposed to be fun. That's why you come to Faithful Word. <laughs> Sit down and shut up and just get through it. And teach it to your one-year-old and get through it. It's true, though. Life's not about just happy all the time. Fun, fun, fun. Well, let's go to a church that's fun when we grow up, right? Let's go to a church where, you know, there's a rock climbing wall in the auditorium and we can, we can climb the wall while we listen to the, the, the service. You know, let's go to a church where you get baptized in a bikini. It'll be fun. There's a church in Fort Worth, Texas where they baptize them in bikinis and it's on their website. You know, that'll get traffic to your website from a bunch of people who are trying to look at porno. I mean, good night. But this is what America's turning to. Don't t you say, oh, Pastor Ashton, you're being ridiculous. Those kids aren't going to grow up and do that. Then why were independent fundamental Baptist churches all over America in the 60s running thousands and thousands of people? Where did all those people's kids go? They've been absorbed into the new evangelical movement, into the charismatic movement, because they want to go somewhere where a woman is going to preach to them and it's going to be fun. Or a guy who's just a, he's such a sissy that, you know, it might as well be a woman because he acts like a woman because he's a feminine. There's nothing wrong with a woman acting like a woman. Women should be feminine. But when a guy acts like a woman, that just makes me sick. Yeah. And we got a bunch of, well, you know, and God never tend to women behind the pulpit or womanly men behind the pulpit. Right. But they grow up and they go to some sissified, queer little church where it's, Where it's devoid of doctrine, like junior church is devoid of doctrine. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to tell you tonight, these kids are growing up because if you train up a child the way he should go when he's old and not depart from it, and if you train up your little infant and child, you say, oh, the kid, these babies are too young to understand what you're preaching. You know what? You'd be shocked how much they do understand, number one. I've had my very small children come up to me and, and say things that show that they comprehend it. But not only that, number two, they're learning what church is like. It's hymns. It's Amen. preaching. The preacher Amen. yells. The preacher is a man. The preacher is preaching hard. They're being programmed. They're learning this is what church is like. Thank you for bringing that infant back in the service right now while I'm preaching. You're getting it. She just had to change the diaper. Wasn't that so terrible? That just ruined the whole service. Thank you for ruining the... I was, see, see, here's the thing. I was trying to get everybody in a trance right now. So that they would all come down the aisle. <laughs> Everyone, close your eyes. Bow your head. Feel it. Stand to your feet. Come to the aisle. Make your way to the front. Get on your knees at my feet. And you ruined the whole trance. Because you brought a kid. You say, oh, well, people need to get... How are they going to get saved if a baby cries in the service? How do they get saved out soul winning when dogs are barking, rap music is blasting from the hoopty across the street, little kids are crying, kids are screaming, food is burning on the stove. They get saved because they hear the Bible. Not because they're in some emotional trance. Amen. Some trance that they're in where you hypnotize them. <laughs> oh, you're getting very sleepy. <laughs> when the music begins to play, the moment that her finger touches the very first note of the piano, when you hear that moment, jump to your feet. Come down the aisle. The choir is singing. Come now. Come before it's too late. Come to be saved. Where 
is any of that in the Bible, this emotionalism? I'm all for soul winning and compelling people to be saved. But you know what? It's done one-on-one -on -one most of the time in the Bible. Most of the time in the Bible, you know, it's Jesus with the woman at the well and so forth. You know, most of the time it was two by two being sent out from house to house. That's what I saw in the Bible. Amen. Towns and villages preaching the gospel. It came in a little town, a little village to whoever would listen, whatever house would listen. But we think they have to be entranced. And, it is, and that's what it's like. You know, I learned this in Bible college. They said the invitation is what the whole service is about. They said the invitation begins in the parking lot. We <laughs> greet them and bring them in. And this is what they said. They said the whole service is geared toward getting them to obey your commands. Because they said that's why. They said, why do you think we have people stand up to sing, sit down, stand up, sit down? It's to get them used to responding to what you say. This is what I was taught at Hiles Anderson. They said, you say, stand up, sit down, come down the aisle, kneel at, our, at, at the steps. It's just another command. They've obeyed like 15 commands before you get to the invitation. Turn in your songbook. Stand to your feet. So they're just getting used to responding. That Yeah, that's going to get them saved. That's the power of God. Okay? But, we, but, but see, the Protestants have, have palmed this off on us. And we think that that's what church is about. Church is not to get people saved. Our church is for the edification of the body of Christ. Church is for the edification of the saints. Church is not... People criticize my preaching. Oh, you didn't preach the gospel. That's because I'm preaching to a room full of people that are saved. Amen. Amen. That's right. They need to hear other things in the Bible. They need to grow and learn and be taught and fed more than just say salvation, 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 salvation. Hello, they're already saved. I, I'm pretty sure that every single person in this room is saved right now, as far as I know. And if somebody in here is not saved, then, you know what, it's not because they haven't heard the gospel. And so, and by the way, I want to preach to the whole group here, not just to one person that might be here and not be saved. And so, yes, I can see how if you're trying to get people in a trance so that they can get saved, when they hear that baby cry, they're like, no, I think I'm going to wait. I'm not, I'm, I, no, I'm not ready Oh, 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 wait, where am I? Oh, no, I'm not going to come down the aisle. Wait a minute. I was just hypnotized there for a minute. You know, I was just doing whatever the pastor said. And so look, guess what? Go give the people the gospel after the service. And if kids are out, I take my kids out soul winning with me. Oh, but the distraction. I, one time Brother Dave gave the gospel to this guy. The rap music was so loud, I could not even follow what he was saying. <laughs> I mean, I just heard, boom, boom, and Brother Dave was like, blah, 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 you know, and the guy somehow could understand Dave. And eventually the music was turned off and he was saved. I mean, Brother Dave started kind of rapping. You know? like, I mean, the music was so loud, he couldn't help but start to flow with it. As he gave God, he started rhyming a little. As he gave God, no, I'm just kidding. Look, there's distractions out in the world, my friend. Deal with it. But look at, uh, I'll close with this, and I, I'm running out of time, but illustration. Look at Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter number 7. I'm skipping a few things, but look at Acts chapter 7. <coughs> Heaven and hell is in the balance here. We can't have a baby disrupting the service. Heaven and hell is not in the balance right now while I'm preaching. Heaven and hell is in the balance out on soul winning. Out door to door. That's where it's in the balance. And you know what? The children in here happen to be very important to me. In fact, I think they might even be more important than you are. These are the leaders of tomorrow. These are the preachers and soul winners of tomorrow. I want to start training them when they're born. I want them to hear the preaching the day they're born. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb. But you're telling me that the preaching and God's word has no impact on an infant. How did John the Baptist? Because he recognized the, the, the presence of Jesus Christ in proximity in the womb of Mary, somehow he recognized that and leaped in his mother's womb. You know what? My kids, they know the sound of my preaching when they're born because they've been in the womb listening. I mean, I, my kids start hearing this kind of preaching while they're in their mother's womb. You think they're going to grow up and listen to Joyce Meyer? Because they're not. But look at this, Acts 720. In which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair. <coughs> And nourished up in his father's house three months. 
And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was mighty in words and deeds. And when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren and the children of Israel. So here's a, a baby boy, he's three months old, taken from his father's house, put in a little ark of bulrushes, sent down the Nile River, and who followed after to make sure that he would be okay? His sister Miriam. And his sister Miriam followed to see what would become of the child. Pharaoh's daughter herself was bathing herself in the river with her maidens. She sees this basket and she hears the crying. She goes over to the basket, she opens up the basket, and the babe wept. She looked down on that child and she had compassion on him. She noticed right away, this is one of the Hebrews' children, she said in Exodus chapter number two. This is one of the Hebrews' children. She picked it up, she loved him, she had compassion on him, she wanted him to be her adopted son. Miriam steps in at this point and says, Shall I go and call one of the Hebrew women to nurse the child for, for you? And she says, Great idea. You know, she hasn't had a child. She can't nurse the baby. She doesn't have any milk. And so she hands the baby to Miriam and said, Take this to one of the Hebrew women to nurse this child, and I will give thee thy wages. And so, guess who raised that child until he was weaned from his mother's breast? His own mother. His spiritual, God-fearing, righteous parents, who by faith, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents. Because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid, listen to these words, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Did you hear that? Godly, righteous people, they raised him for how long? How long is a child nursing? Till they're about two years old. Here, you know, when they... When they're, you know, three years old, they're not still nursing. Somebody told me one time in school, in Christian school, they said, Oh yeah, the Hebrews would nurse their kids till they were six or seven. I was like, are you an idiot? I mean, that's, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. What, do they just walk up and, and, and latch on? I mean, you know, when they grow a whole mouthful of sharp teeth and start eating, you know, a cheeseburger, you know, they're done nursing. And so obviously children only nurse till they're probably about, two, about the time they turn two. You know, usually women nurse children, maybe they stop at one year old, would be like the earliest that they usually stop, about one, maybe then more like two. Jusha, am I right? One to two is probably a good range. Not three, not four, not seven, weirdo. <laughs> I guess it's a cap that means accountability, I don't know. <laughs> but the point that I'm trying to make is, that, that that child was only in his parents' house till he was two years old. And yet, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, 40 years old, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, Moses... It says, by faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was visible. Now, does that sound familiar? By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parent, because they saw he was a proper child, they were not afraid of the king's commandment. And then, by faith he forsook Egypt, a few verses down, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Where did he get that attribute of not fearing the king's commandment? Always obey the king. What? Obey Obama. What? You think that his parents were a bunch of Ob Obama Democrats? God ordained Obama. Obey Obama. That almost sounds like a good slogan. This is the slogan of Independent Fundamental Labs. Obey Obama. They should make it into a bumper sticker. Obey Obama. Obama can drop dead and go to hell. As far as I'm concerned, the baby, butchering, filthy, murderous pervert that he is. Destroying America every day. He's only been in office for, what, five days. He's already funding abortions all yeah, over the yeah. world. That's right. Do you have a newspaper? He funds abortions all over the world right. this week. He's already wants to spend a bunch of money. He already wants to uh, sell my children into debt and into slavery. Obey Obama. 
I thank God that, you know, Moses' parents didn't obey Obama. Yeah. And you know what? Moses, when he was coming to years, had the exact same attribute. Because when you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And he'll fear God rather than fearing man. I mean, ideally, you fear both, right? Obey, obey authority. But you know what? Fear God nuts to man when they're a wicked, ungodly man who's going against God. You say, oh, let every soul, Romans, crap, Romans 15, crap. <laughs> let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. Let me just, I, I know this is going to shock you, but America is not a monarchy. Yeah. Did you know that? Right. I know you're showing me all these verses about obeying the king and fearing the king. We don't have a king. Did right. you know that? I'm, I'm sorry, but you, you must not have been around. There was this thing in 1776 called the Declaration of Independence where they separated themselves from King George III. That's right. And we did not have King George W. and King Barack. We, don't, we haven't had kings in this country in over 200 years. And so guess what? The, you're not going to believe this. The highest power in America is the Constitution That's right. That's right. of the yeah. United States. And guess what else the highest power? The people. Right. Because yeah. we have a government of the people, by the people, for the people. And when that government ceases to serve our ends of promoting the life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the Declaration of Independence, which also forms our founding documents, the laws of our land, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, it said that it is the right of the people to, to, to uh, alter or abolish it. It's their right and their duty to alter it or abolish it. That's the Declaration of Independence. And so the highest power in this land is the people because we live in a free country. Now, look, I agree. If we're living in some kind of a monarchy where we have a king over us, then we must obey that king. But if we have somebody who we elected to follow the Constitution, who swore an oath or tried to, uh, 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 faithfully, uh, 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 execute babies, I mean, execute the office of President of the United States, no, no, no. So help me, Allah. What an idiot. You, know? you think he would have memorized it? It's like 10 seconds long. He's like, come again? Excuse me? What's the oath again? And then he swore it a second time, not on the Bible. Yeah. Where was the Holy Bible when you said it right, Obama? Because when you get the Bible around, you know what? That's probably what was messing him up, the Bible. That's right. Yeah, he got in the presence of God's Word. It's like when that stupid uh, idol fell on its face, you know, in 1 Samuel, Dagon, and only the stump was left. Because as soon as you put God and His Word, and by the way, you know what was in the Ark of the Covenant? God's Word. Guess what was in it? Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant written with the finger of God. God's word and the book of the law and Aaron's rod that budded were in that ark. They set that ark next to Dagon and he fell on his face before God. And what did Obama do? You put God in front of him, the word of God. He puts his hand on it. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we wish would have happened. Yeah. <laughs> we wish he would have fell on his face and we'd only have the stump of Obama left. You know? but, but you know what? Uh, he, he got all choked up and he said, uh, can, we, can we try it without the Bible this time? And he, they tried it without the Bible and he was like, oh, God. oh yeah, you know, it's no problem, solemnly swear. What did that do? I don't know. Oh yeah, <laughs> the president swears an oath to the Constitution, that's the law. If the, did you know that if there's any law in America that contradicts the Constitution, the Constitution supersedes. Right. Yeah. Because let every soul be subject to the highest power. Guess who the highest power is? God. Yeah. Guess who's next? The U.S. Constitution. Not King Obama. And as soon as our leaders are out of bounds of the Constitution, we got to go with the Constitution. Period. I don't, you know, you can believe that or not. I don't care what you think. That's what, that's what the Bible says. And so, uh, let's close the sermon. But the point is that children are inherited to the Lord. The fruit of the womb is His reward. I want to train my children up to be righteous and godly. I want them to be in church, in the womb, as a newborn, as a child. They're probably the most important people in this service right now, are all the little children. Thank God I look out and see all the little children. Praise the Lord. Praise God for them. And you know what? Let's go out and win children to Christ too. You know, I'm not saying to, to go around and, and sneak into people's houses and, and uh, you know, talk to some kid who shouldn't even be answering the door and stuff. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying, get the permission from the parents and give those kids the gospel. 
Win them to Christ. Get them saved. Don't miss that up. I bet you're missing some opportunities out soul winning by not taking time to win those kids to the Lord. You ought to take that chance. You ought to take that opportunity to, uh, to win them to Christ. And then, and then, you know what? Let's have them in the service. Let's preach to them. Let's teach them the hymns. Let's not dumb them down. And uh, let's bow our heads forward in prayer. Father, we love you and, and thank you for our church. And we thank you for a church where, where children are welcome in the service, where we don't see children as a burden or a distraction. We don't see them as a nuisance, but dear God, we see them as the future. We see them as important people. We want Jesus to touch them. We want him to bless them. We want to set them in the midst of us, in the middle of the service, where they can hear God's word preached. God, we want to receive you. We want to receive children. And we want to preach to children the gospel of Jesus Christ. Please help us to have a proper respect and understanding of children. And we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.